Hello everybody. So, we are in uh, module 2 theory of probability and we are going to discuss today joint distribution. Now, if you recall in our last lectures, we have discussed the definition of a random variable and how we quantify a random variable along with some of the applications. Now, in reality when we talk about design problems, it involves multiple number of random variables that actually motivates us to investigate from one dimension that means only a single random variable involved in the problem to what happens and how we can quantify when a problem that means a limit state has more than one random variable. So, let us start with two random variables and we consider two variables x and y. As was in the case of a single random variable, say for example x, the problem is defined through the definition of the random variable involved. So, we had only one random variable previously. So, we defined the probability density function or probability mass function. Once we define PMF or small pdf, then from that we can also quantify the cumulative distribution function. Now, the logic goes similarly in case of two dimension. So, we have two random variables and then again we define the joint probability density function as you can see in this case it is defined following the same notation. So, either small p or small f then subscript the description of the random variables. In this case we have two. So, we have x and y here and then of course, they are in capital and then within the first bracket the small uh, x and y representing the particular value of those random variables. So, this joint probability density function actually defines the problem in two dimension. As you can see on your screen, we have the joint density function for x and y combined and you can see this uh, surface which actually indicates the shape of this joint PDF. Now, if we wish to find out what is the probability that x will be bounded between two limits a 1 and a 2, while y will be bounded between b 1 and b 2, obviously we have to integrate this joint probability density function over the appropriate limits. In this case, we have f x y which is integrated over a dx and dy and over a limit of a 1, a 2 and b 1, b 2. It gives the total probability that x will remain within the bound of a 1, a 2 and y will remain within b 1 and b 2. Now, if we push this limits to the extreme, this is a continuous random variable obviously, it can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, if we push this limits to minus infinity to plus infinity, we will in turn get the total probability under the joint PDF. Now, as per the definition of the probability, if you recall, the total probability under the joint distribution is also 1. Now, we can get capital PDF or capital CDF from small PDF and vice versa. So, either way we can define the problem. So, if we define the problem using capital f x y that means probability distribution function, then if we differentiate that function twice, we will get small pdf. This is exactly similar to what we did in case of one dimension, just we add one more variable here and obviously, as we keep on increasing this way, the basic definition will remain same. That means, to get PDF, I mean small PDF, we have to differentiate the capital PDF with appropriate uh, order. Now, 
if you look at the description of joint PDF that means small f x y x y which is shown on your screen. Now, for every x and y we have a vertical coordinate that represents the relative frequency of occurrence of these two variable together. So, if we take say x i and y i then corresponding to that value we have one value of the joint PDF. Now, if we integrate this function, this is a function of x and y. Now, if we integrate it over one dimension, for example, if we integrate this joint function over say y and then we will have the function which is only having x, the other dimension. Because after integrating this joint function over the appropriate limits, then there will be no y. We have integrated it over the complete domain and then obviously, we will have only the remaining variable. As you can see in the on the screen, so if we integrate over complete y, obviously, we will have the function of x which is basically the projection over this plane. Now, this f x of x is nothing but the PDF of x itself and we call it marginal of x or marginal density of x. Similarly, if we integrate over x, we will have f y of y which is the marginal density of y. These are clearly shown in the figure on your screen. So, if we have the joint distribution and if we take the projection, we get basically the marginals. Now, uh, the most important property is that when we define the joint distribution, we completely define the variables and from this joint distribution, we can easily find out what are the marginals. However, if we have only marginals, we cannot easily find out what are the joint distributions. Of course, as we progress, we will see how to cast this joint distribution when these marginals are given, but that needs some extra mathematical modeling to get this joint distribution from the marginals. However, once the joint distribution is given, we can easily find out the marginals. Unfortunately, for every design problem we start with, we start always start with marginal distributions. If I give an example, say we have a beam experiencing some point load and let us assume that uh, the material property for example, Young's modulus and say Poisson's ratio these two are random variable. In that case, we test the material and from that testing we can figure out what are the distributions associated with say Young's modulus and that for the Poisson's ratio. Now, these are actually marginals and from that we can also quantify the correlation as we progress we will discuss that and from that information we can cast the joint distribution. So, the take up point is for every design problem we actually start with marginals and from that we first need to cast the joint distribution if we need to use them in our reliability based design. However, we should always remember that from joint distribution we can easily find out marginal and not vice versa. Okay, so, let us move forward. So, in case of two random variables, we also need to define the conditional probability density as you can see on your screen. It is the probability density of x given y. So, x given y, so its values are small x given y1, y1 is the value where we fix y and then we figure out the distribution of x. Now, we have already discussed this model in our uh, uh, previous lecture. So, this conditional probability can be defined by the expression the joint distribution of x y, where y is anchored at a particular point divided by f y of y. It comes with a condition that provided pro probability of y should not be equal to 0. 
Now that is the definition of conditional probability which again is shown in the diagram. So, we have a joint distribution here and in fact in these case because uh, of the shape of this function we can conclude that they are probably correlated. Now from that you can see the marginals and the contour on the screen the blue lines concentric blue lines they actually show the joint PDF uh, between x and y. Now, if we fix a value of x and then draw a vertical line as you can see the dotted line on your screen and then find out the PDF that is basically the conditional PDF of y given x. Similarly, we can fix y and then draw a horizontal line and then find out the corresponding conditional density of x given y. So, if we continue from the conditional PDF, we can also find out conditional CDF. That means, we have to integrate the function over appropriate limits and then obviously, we will get the conditional CDF. That means, capital F of x given y. Now, if we extend this definition for the expectation operator, then obviously expected value of x1 given x2 in this case we have two variables x1 and x2 where x2 takes a value of small x2 then as per definition this expectation operator over x1 given x2 will be x1 because we are about to find the expectation of x1 given x2 so it is x1 then pdf of x1 given x2 and integrated over x1. So, this is the definition of expectation over conditional density function. Similarly, we can also define the variance. Variance of x1 given x2 taking a value of small x2 is nothing but expectation of x1 minus the first moment of x1 given x2 and square of that obviously. So, this is in a way central moment for the condition given by this relation x1 given x2. So, if the variables involved in this case that is x1 and x2 if they are independent obviously, in that case one is not affected by the others and if we follow that description obviously, we can simplify it further and we can prove that expected value of x1 given x2 is nothing but expected value of x1 itself because the joint density x1 given x2 is not affected by x2 because they are independent. Obviously, it will reduce to f of x1 and then ultimately leading to expected value of x1 itself. So, now with that definition let us move forward. So, in case of one dimensional problems so, we solve this case where z is a function of a random variable. Now, because now we have two dimension, we have x and y. So, let us investigate if we know this function g and w sorry g and h and then which are functions of x and y. So, we have two variables z and w, then is it possible to find out the joint density of f z w given the complete description of x and y. Now, because we have two dimension the complete description means the joint density between x and y. As we did in case of a single variable, we first obtained what are the solutions of that say z equal to g x and those roots we use to define the PDF of z. Similarly, in this case for a given z and w, there can be many solutions for this two functions. Obviously, those combinations are say x1, x2 sorry x1, y1, x2, y2 up to x and yn. It means all these actually satisfies the relation that means z is equal to g of xi, yi. Similarly, w equal to h of xi and yi. So, what we wish to do? 
we used to equate for the probability within the z domain with the description given in x y. So, in turn if we look at this figure, so in the z w plane we let us consider this rectangle a b c d and that if we project through this relation in the x y plane we get a prime b prime c prime and d prime. Obviously, the probability under this region a b c d should equate with the same probability under the parallelogram whose area is delta i. So, that is explained here probability that z will remain z to z plus dz. We consider a differential element of size dz. So, on the screen a b is nothing but the increment we have. So, we wish to find out probability that z will remain z to z plus dz and w will remain between w to w plus dz dw sorry. That means, within this square area which is nothing but in terms of g x y and w x y it will remain again within z to z plus dz and w to w plus dw. Now, if we find out the total probability we can easily do it through the small pdf. So, we know the joint density function denoted by f z w times the increment in z and increment in w. So, this is the area multiplied by the pdf, this pdf we are going to find out that is the problem statement. But the multiplication of these two the area and the pdf gives the total probability defined by this pdf within a region a b c d. Now, to solve this problem we have to first find out what is the equivalent region of this delta z times delta w in x y plane that is the first task. If you can recall we identified the shaded regions uh, in case of one dimensional problem. It is exactly similar just in these case we have one more dimension. So, if you look at the diagram the point A that means here which is having a coordinate of z and w the corresponding point in the x y z plane is basically a prime whose coordinate is x i and y i. Now, using this logic we can actually find out the coordinates of all other points and then the total probability that x and y belongs to this region identified by delta i is nothing but again the pdf the joint pdf in x y times the corresponding area. So, if we equate these two we get an expression that you can see on your screen. So, joint probability between z and w times the incremental area in the z w plane is equal to all possibilities in x y plane. So, we have pdf in the x y plane times the delta i the corresponding area in the x y plane. So, now if we can find out what is the relation between this delta i and the incremental area in the z w plane we can easily solve this problem because from the definition of this problem we know what is the joint density between x and y. So, the right hand side is known provided we quantify delta i and the relation the delta i has with the incremental area in the z w plane. Then we can easily find out the joint density between z and w. So, let us see how we can solve this problem. So, we quantify delta i what is there on your screen that is the area of the parallelogram in terms of the incremental area in z w plane. And for this purpose we denote x i in terms of a function g 1 z w and y i another function h 1 z w. So, now the point z w actually is mapped to x y z plane as x i y i that is a prime. Similarly, we can also map all other corners and the coordinates are given here. So, for example, b prime has a coordinate z plus delta z and w, c prime having a coordinate z, 
w plus delta w and then uh, finally, we can also find out the coordinate of d prime. Now, using this information, we can further find out what is the coordinate of b prime and we get this expression. So, g 1 the new function that we have defined at this point b prime if we expand that we get the expression on your screen. So, we have g 1 function evaluated at z w plus the increment the slope times the delta z. So, that gives the next coordinate. So, we have x i plus first differential of g 1 with respect to z times delta z that is the increment along z. Similarly, the other coordinate also we can find out and following that logic we can find out the coordinate of all other corners of the parallelogram. Now, we can find out the area a prime, b prime, c prime, d prime from the geometry and uh, it involves dimensions a prime, b prime and a prime, c prime along with the angles theta and phi shown on your screen. Now, if we simplify this from the geometry, we can find out all these sines and cosines in terms of the differentials that we have already defined and so a prime b prime cos phi is nothing but g 1 differentiated with respect to z times the increment along z. Similarly, all other expression you can see on your screen and if you put back this expression here in this expression of delta i, we can find it in terms of the slopes that we have already figured out and if you look at this expression obviously on the right hand side you have the differential increment in z w plane. So, delta z times delta w is the differential area we are talking about. So, the ratio of delta i and delta z times delta w is simplified and we basically get the Jacobian matrix. So, in this case we have to find out this Jacobian matrix. In fact, if you recall the one dimensional problem there we identified the slope and we considered the modulus of that slope and using that we correlated the PDFs in two different variable space one was x another was z. In this case we have x and y and z and w. So, we figure out this Jacobian and this Jacobian we can actually define using z and w and x and y either way and the interrelation between these two is also shown in your screen. So, now if we combine this information because we have already figured out the interrelation between delta i that is the incremental area in the x y plane and the incremental area in the z w plane. So, if you recall the previous expression that we have already derived, this is the expression. Here, if we divide both side by delta z times delta w, obviously on the left hand side we have the joint density between z and w, while on the right hand side the first expression f x y is the joint density between x and y and delta i divided by delta z delta w we have already figured out. So, if we combine these two information, we get a very nice expression of the joint distribution between z and w and then using the known information that is the joint density of x and y, we can find out what is the joint density between z and w. Now, let us consider a problem and see how we can actually use this model to solve the joint density. So, we have x and y two random variables having 0 mean these are Gaussian random variables and their variance is sigma square. Now, if we define two more random variable one is r, r is nothing but square root of x square plus y square and theta which is tan inverse y by x. Then our task is to find out the joint density function and from this expression we can easily conclude that 
theta ranges from minus infinity sorry minus pi to plus pi. So, the problem is defined in terms of x and y. So, our starting point is obviously x and y and the joint density between x and y we can easily write down because it is a Gaussian density and then the expression is known to us. Then we are also given the relation r and theta. So, we define this g and h in this case g of x and y is nothing but square root of x square plus y square and h of x and y is nothing but tan inverse y by x. So, now we can define in a similar way g 1 and h 1 as we did in case of deriving the expression on your screen. So, we can now find out what is the Jacobian in terms of r and theta as well as using x and y. Now, if we consider the first expression the Jacobian in terms of r and theta and we do this calculation because now we can differentiate x 1 with respect to r and theta while y 1 with respect to r and theta and then if we simplify we get the expression is r. Similarly, we can also approach the Jacobian from x y. So, there also we can figure out what is this expression and what ultimately we get is 1 by r r. And if you recall the relation between these two is j r theta is nothing but 1 by j x y and that is also satisfied here. So, if you continue, if you recall this joint density we have already obtained. Now, for the problem we are solving, we have to actually identify these components and then just put the values. So, the joint density between r and theta we can easily find out using the Jacobian and then the definition of joint density in x and y. So, we have this expression here where again the range of theta is from minus pi to plus pi and the range of r is obviously from 0 to infinity. Now, this is the joint density between r and theta. So, if we integrate over one dimension obviously, we will get the marginal density corresponding to the other dimension. So, if we can figure out what is f r of r we basically integrate the joint density over theta using the appropriate limits that has already been explained. Now, if you do that obviously, we get the marginal of f r of r which is there on the screen. Similarly, we can also find out what is f theta of theta in that case we have to integrate over r using appropriate range in this case 0 to infinity. Now, if you look at these two expression you can easily conclude what is the what are the natures of this distribution. So, the first one we have it is the Rayleigh distribution while the second one where the density is constant over the finite limit and this is uniform distribution. Not only that we can also conclude that the joint density f of r theta is nothing but the product of marginals that means f r of r and f theta of theta. So, if that is the case what we can conclude is that r is independent of theta because in that case only the product of two marginal gives us the joint density function. Now, if we continue further in some problems we have only one function say z as a function of x and y. Now, how we can use the model we have already developed for this case. In that case what we do we actually introduce an auxiliary variable that means another dimension we introduce and then obviously, first we find out the joint density and then from joint density if we integrate the joint density over the auxiliary variable we will basically get the density marginal of the dimension we are looking for in this case it is z. So, let us consider a problem we have a function z is equal to x plus y and obviously, the joint density between x and y is given. So, in that case what we do we introduce an auxiliary variable say w equal to y. 
then we define the problem in exactly similar way we have solved for the previous problem. So, in this case again we find out x 1 and y 1 in terms of z and w. So, as per our definition y 1 is equal to w and x 1 is nothing but z minus w. So, from this definition we can find out what is the Jacobian and then once we find out the Jacobian we can use that information to find out what is the joint density. In this case Jacobian is 1. So, obviously joint density between z and w we can easily figure out. Now, if this expression if we integrate over w as I have already explained we will get the marginal f z of z. So, in some problems where we have only one nonlinear function is given then we can introduce an auxiliary variable to solve the problem. Let us move forward. So, we have x uniformly distributed between 0 and 1 and y uniformly distributed between 0 and 1 and obviously they are independent random variables and then we define z using this nonlinear expression. Then our objective is to find out what is the density of z. So, in this case again we have to introduce the auxiliary variable and exactly the way I have already described we find out the expressions of x 1 and y 1 using this definition of auxiliary variable and then from that definition we can estimate what is the Jacobian. As you can see in this case our Jacobian turns out to be the expression on your screen. And then finally, once the Jacobian is estimated we can easily find out what will be the joint density between z and w. Obviously, in this case we can easily figure out what are the ranges of z and w, z ranges from minus infinity to plus infinity while w is between 0 to 1. So, then to find out what is the f z of z we have to integrate the joint density over the remaining dimension that means in this case the auxiliary variable is w. So, we integrate over w using appropriate limit and then finally, we will get the expression for the pdf of z. Now, in this expression we have to estimate this integral. So, that we do using a transformation where u is equal to z tan 2 pi w. Obviously, we can find out differential of u and then we can simplify this expression further and then ultimately we get f z of z is nothing but 1 by square root of 2 pi a to the power z square by 2. Now, this is a normal density function having 0 mean and unit standard deviation. So, if we further investigate now the expectation operator over two dimensions. So, you have a function say x 1 and x 2 of g and then we want to find out expected value of g given the variable x 1 and x 2. Then as per definition of the expectation this is a two dimensional case. So, we have double integral then the function itself that is in this case g of x 1 and x 2 times because it is a two dimensional problem obviously, the p d f between x 1 and x 2 and then integrated over d x 1 d x 2 with appropriate limits. Obviously, this is a continuous variable and the limits are minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, if we just put some expression in this case g of x 1 x 2 is nothing but x 1 to the power m x 2 to the power n then obviously, it will follow the same logic. So, our function is x 1 to the power n x 2 to the power n expected value of that function will be nothing but the function itself multiplied by the joint density and integrated over the appropriate limits. Now, we can change the variable m and n and we can find out all necessary moments for this joint dimension. We can actually find out central moment also. So, the central moment involving x 1 and x 2 will be x 1 minus mu 1 to the power m and x 2 minus mu 2 to the power n. It is central simply because with respect to mu 1 and mu 2 and then we can find out this expectation that means 
as per definition given above. In this case, we have already defined g of x1, x2 that means it is x1 minus mu1 to the power m, x2 minus mu2 to the power n. So, multiply that with the respective joint density and integrate over the appropriate domain. So, if you find out the central moment for m equal to 1, n equal to 1, we basically get the covariance between x1 and x2. And that as per definition can be obtained using this double integral on your screen. And we know that the ratio of this covariance and the respective standard deviation, product of standard deviation is nothing but the correlation coefficient. This non-dimensional number varies between 0 to 1. You can refer any standard textbook to prove that. I leave it as an exercise. So, we have defined the expectation operator in two dimension. So, let us put some example. So, we have a function g of x1 comma x2 is nothing but x1 times x2. And let us consider a special case where x1 is independent of x2. That means, the joint density f of x1, x2 will be the product of f x1 and f x2. Now, if we find out what is the expected value of z as per definition, the function is x1, x2 times the joint density between x1 and x2 integrated over the appropriate limit. Now, because we use the assumption that x1 is independent of x2, then we can separate out these two integrals. So, you have one integral over x, similarly another over sorry x1 and another over x2 and then ultimately we get the product of these two integrals which individually actually lead to mu 1 and mu 2 that means the first moment of x 1 and x 2. Similarly, in this case we can also find out the variance that is the second central moment. So, the variance in this case will turn out to be mu 1 square sigma 2 square plus mu 2 square sigma 1 square plus sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square. This can be derived following the definition of joint density and in this case the coefficient of variation square also given where coefficient of variation is nothing but the ratio of the standard deviation and mean. Now, I can leave this as an exercise and you can try it yourself and check whether you get this expressions. Now, the question is we have discussed how to transform the joint density function using Jacobian. So, the question is if we have a function involving multiple random variables, is there any way to estimate the first two moments? Just like in case of one dimensional problem, we used using Taylor series expansion. In this case also, it is indeed possible. So, we have z which is a function of x and x having more than one random variable. So, x is basically a vector random variable x 1, x 2, x 3 up to x n. Now, in that case again, we actually apply Taylor series expansion, which is an infinite series and you can see on your screen the expression, the general expression of the Taylor series. And then let us consider the first few terms in the Taylor series expansion. So, if we follow that logic, we have z is equal to g x and if we consider the first two terms in Taylor series expansion, we guess basically get the first equation on your screen. Now, in this equation, if we take the expectation operator on either side of this equation, so on the left hand side, we will have expected value of z and on the right hand side, we have expected value of g mu. Obviously, this is a constant, so it will be g mu itself. Then expected value of this first differential of g with respect to all random variables involved, then times x j minus mu j. Obviously, the first differential is evaluated at mu point is constant because we use mean as a reference point. So, our expectation operator will sit over this function x j minus mu j and that will lead to 
0 simply because we subtract mean from the random variable obviously the expected value of that first central moment will be 0. So, if we do that we get the expected value of z that is the first moment which is approximately equal to g the nonlinear function evaluated at the mean points. Now, this is an approximate estimation of g obviously, because we truncate the series after the second term. However, this gives the first estimate of uh, expected value of z. Now, if we follow the same logic we did we followed in case of one dimension, we have estimated this first moment. So, we subtract the first moment from z that means, this g mu which is approximately equal to the first moment we take it on the other side. So, z minus mu z is nothing but this expression. And then if you square it up and take the expectation obviously, we will get the variance. However, in this case we have on the right hand side the expectation between two different random variables x j and x k. So, if we take the expectation we can show that the variance of z is nothing but the product of first differential and evaluated with respect to mean point times the covariance between two different random variables. Obviously, when i equal to j we have the covariance between x i and x i that is the variance of x i. So, this helps us to find out first two moment using Taylor series expansion. It is not exact, but it is very useful for some preliminary investigations. So, if we take an example, we have a beam and the stress of this beam having axial load as well as transverse load. So, we know the stress where the moment at a particular location say the midpoint follows normal distribution with mean and standard deviation given in appropriate unit and the axial load p also follows normal distribution with appropriate mean and standard deviation given. Now, the cross sectional area of this beam given and the section modulus also follows normal distribution. So, we have altogether three different random variables m, p, and z. Among these three, the two loads that is m and p they are correlated and the correlation coefficient is also given. Now, in this case we wish to find out the first two moments of the stress given by this relation. So, obviously, if you recall our first moment of z is nothing but the nonlinear function evaluated at the main point, while the variance we can also estimate using the covariance. So, the first moment that is mu of s is nothing but this nonlinear function evaluated at mean. So, we have three random variables m, z and p. We put the respective mean values and then we can solve what is the first moment of the stress s and in this case it turns out to be 3.81 mpa. Now, following the same logic we can also find out variance, but in that case we have to differentiate this function with respect to the random variables which are m, z and p. So, we have the slopes evaluated at the main point times the standard deviation square of the respective random variable and that expression is given here and because it has a correlation between m and p. So, we have the final term which actually involves the correlation between these two dimension and then finally, if we put the values we get the variance is 0.525 ultimately giving us the standard deviation as 0.72 mp. So, this problem clearly tells how to actually use the Taylor series approximation for multivariate case. So, if we extend for another problem we have a again a simply supported beam with a transverse load and the length of the beam is 10 meter, Young's modulus 
follows normal distribution with mean and standard deviation given, while the load also follows normal distribution with appropriate mean and standard deviation on your screen. And the I for this beam is also given. Our objective is to find out the first two moments of the deflection at the center because the midpoint of this beam will experience maximum deformation and in serviceability limit state we actually focus at that point and design the beam. So, we consider the mean of the central deformation. So, deformation at the midpoint is nothing but P L cube by 48 E i which comes from the structural analysis. So, the mean of that is when we evaluate this expression using the mean value of the random variable involved in this case. So, in this case we have two random variables that is P and capital E. So, you put the mean values of those random variables which are given in the problem statement and find out what is the mean of the central deformation which turns out in this case to be 25 millimeter. Then we can find out the slope that means first differentiation of delta with respect to P and with respect to E and then we can evaluate those variables at the mean point and find out what are those two quantities as you can see on your screen and then finally, we can find out what is the variance using this information. Ultimately, it gives us the standard deviation of delta is 6.9868 millimeter. Now, if we just extend that logic further, what is the probability that this central deformation will actually cross an allowable limit of L by 375. This type of limits are often specified in our design codes. So, we consider a limit of L by 375. So, our allowable central deformation is 26.7 millimeter. So, what is the probability that the delta is more than delta allowable that we can easily find out from the PDF that you can see on your screen. So, the blue line is the PDF for delta and what is the probability that delta will be more than this delta allowable we can easily find out and it is 0 0.4057. So, we can see how we can use the Taylor series approximation to solve the first two moment. So, if we follow the same model for a different problem in this case we have an RCC beam and its dimension B and D it is a random variable whose mean and standard deviations are given. So, what we wish to find out the first two statistical moments of the resistance at that section which is nothing but the capacity. And then also we wish to determine the probability of failure if the applied bending moment is 650 kilo Newton meter. Now, for this RCC beam we already know the moment of resistance which comes from this expression where x u is basically the depth of neutral axis from the top fiber okay. and small d is nothing but the depth of the brim up to the central line of the bottom reinforcement as shown on your screen. Now, the type of steel and type of concrete is given. So, you can further simplify this expression for MR and which ultimately comes out to be 3.45 BD square where B and D are the random variable in this case. So, again if we find out what is the mean of this mu or that is the first moment, we evaluate this expression at the mean point of B and D. So, we put those the respective mean values and we can estimate what is the mean of MR and which is in this case 676.2 kilo Newton meter. Then for the variance, we again first find out the differentiation of MR with respect to the random variables in this case B and D and then evaluate them at the mean point and square it up times the respective variance of the random variable and then sum them up to get the variance of MR. 
So, you put all these values then ultimately we get the standard deviation of MR is nothing but 13.42 kilometer. So, we have estimated the first two moments of the moment of resistance and then we know the applied bending moment. So, we can find out what is the probability and in this case probability is 0 0.026. So, this is a design problem where we have applied Taylor series base expansion to quantify first two moments. Another example, an example that very often we solve in structural design, a simply supported beam with an UDL and a point load. So, the given information for this design problem is L equal to 4 meter. It is made up of steel and the Young's modulus follows normal distribution and the loads in this case W is a normally distributed and also P follows the same distribution. The mean and standard deviation for all these random variables are given. Then we wish to design this beam against a serviceability limit state of L by 250 in this case against a probability failure P f is equal to 10 to the power minus 3. So, again in this case we design the beam against serviceability a simply supported beam the maximum deflection will be at the middle. So, we have the expression for the central deformation due to point load as well as an UDL. Then again estimation of first moment is very simple because we have to evaluate this mean of the delta at the central point where we use the mean of all the random variables. So, we put the values of mean of these random variables in this case P, W and capital E. Obviously, this is a design problem. We have to solve the cross section of the beam which will offer us a probability of failure 10 to the power minus 3. So, we get the first moment in terms of I which is still unknown to us and then we continue further we differentiate this W with respect to all the random variables involved. So, we get its first differentiation with respect to P, W and E and all these are in terms of the unknown I. So, we have already evaluated and then using that information we can find out variance of the central deformation which is again in terms of I. Then we combine these two because we have to solve it for a probability of failure of 10 to the power minus 3. So, we P f is given with an allowable limit. So, if we just put all those values and solve this problem we can actually find out what is the I and in this case the I is 3.59 E 7 millimeter to the power 4. So, now we know what is the expected value of I. So, we can use some standard table and select a beam that can offer this I and if we can do that we expect to achieve a probability level in this case 10 to the power minus 3. So, in this problem we have discussed how to extend the model for first two moments using Taylor series approximation to design a beam that we very often encounter in civil engineering or in reliability based design. Now, if we continue to investigate the moment capacity of the beam, so the moment capacity at the center of the beam we have the expression and then we can find out the first two moments for this beam. So, the first moment of the moment capacity again we evaluate this expression using mean value of the respective random variable and similarly we can also find out the variance of the moment capacity and we get the expression. So, we can find out the first two moments of the moment capacity at the midpoint. So, we can actually completely design this beam against bending. Now, this example as I said 
clearly gives us an idea how we can bring in uncertainty to our design problem and in that process how to integrate the models of theory of probability to solve the design problem. So, with that let us close here. We will further investigate the theory of probability and we will discuss some of the important models that we will use to solve our reliability problems. Thank you. Thank you.